Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Kyle rojas Leglider, and I'm the Senior Director of Policy Advocacy here at the Colorado Health Foundation. At the Colorado Health Foundation, we work to bring health and reach for all Coloradans, focusing on people living on low income and people of color. We do that through grant making, policy advocacy, and research. Today, we're here to talk about research, specifically the 2021 results of PULSE, the Colorado Health Foundation's annual poll. Some of you may be wondering why a health foundation would conduct a poll in the first place. Many of us tend to think of polling just as a way to predict the outcome of an election. But for our poll, PULSE, it's all about listening, listening to Coloradans from every corner of our state and from every racial and ethnic background and all kinds of lived experiences and identities. We listen to their worries, to their perceptions, and to their priorities. We do this because we believe that bringing health and reach for all of us begins with listening and understanding our fellow Coloradans. We also know that listening to each other can happen in many different forms and that there's value in what we can learn from both deep conversations and from quick conversations. An annual poll is just one of the ways that the Colorado Health Foundation listens. We're going to share a short video now that highlights how this particular form of listening can help us understand the people of Colorado just a little bit better. Uh, so buckle up and we'll share a quick video with you now. These days, people spend a lot of time talking, loudly, and oftentimes at each other or past each other. And we definitely don't spend enough time to listen and really understand one another. At the Colorado Health Foundation, we believe in listening first. And that's why we conduct a poll of Coloradans each year. We call it Pulse. From affordable housing to hunger to mental health, our poll takes the pulse of Coloradans on a range of issues that affect their health and well-being to inform policy and advocacy far into the future. Through Pulse, we interview more than 2,000 Colorado adults from every corner of the state. This allows us to dig into different perspectives based on race, ethnicity, income, geography, and more. One of the benefits of this kind of research is that it enables us to discover patterns that connect different groups of Coloradans, as well as track trends and changes in public opinion over time. How do we find Coloradans to interview for polls? We pull a random list of addresses in the state and match those addresses to phone numbers and email addresses. Then we reach out, we call, text, email, and we send snail mail. And we ask them to spend 20 minutes answering our questions about what's on their mind. We make sure that our sample of interviewees reflects the ages, races, genders, political ideologies, and more of all who call Colorado home. While polling has its limitations, the things we learn from Coloradans when we talk to them, their worries, their experiences, their priorities, matter because it helps us understand our state a little better. We learn more about what's keeping people up at night, what's dominating their dinner table conversations, or what they think needs to happen to make the state a better place to live. We then release the complete result of Pulse each year because we want others to listen along with us with the hope that together, we can improve the health of Coloradans. On the Pulse website, you can use our interactive dashboard to go from topic to topic, question by question, and see how different groups responded. From that, we can start to find answers to questions like, how do the experiences of Coloradans living on lower incomes differ from those with higher incomes? How do people of color view certain issues compared to white Coloradans? And what are the major differences of opinions across the various regions of our state? You can dig in a little or a lot to the questions that most intrigue you. At Pulse, our hope is that every step we take is more informed to improve the health of all Coloradans. Pulse is one way among many to actively listen to the people we serve, and we hope you'll use it to listen with us. To learn more, visit www. .copostpoll.org and view the results of our latest poll. Pulse really is a powerful listening tool and we're excited to make it available to all of you today. It pushes us far beyond our usual circles of who we talk to in our day-to-day -day lives um, and who we're in contact with the most. For many of us, it can be easy to only talk to the folks who live in our own community or who share a lot of things in common with us. 
but through Pulse, we're able to have conversations with a broad range of people and share that all back with you. In this year's poll, we heard from more than 2,400 Coloradans in the month of August. With a sample size that large, we're able to zoom out and see patterns across our population. And we're also able to zoom in and see how some groups of people respond differently than other groups. You'll get a flavor of that in today's webinar. In this webinar, we'll walk through what we heard from Coloradans this year. And you'll hear exactly what we asked and exactly what we heard. We think of Pulse as a mirror that we're holding up to the state of Colorado. It's unfiltered and unbiased and reflects back the, the experiences, concerns, and priorities of Coloradans. Anything that we heard in this poll is fully available to the public. If it's knowable from this data, we've taken steps to make that information accessible to you in a variety of different ways that will allow you to explore and go deep on whatever sparks your curiosity the most. So before we dive into the data from this year, I have just a few more housekeeping announcements for today's webinar. First, Everyone is muted to minimize background noise because we are recording this webinar. We'll send out a link to the recording in the next few days. And yes, all of the slides and visuals that you see in today's presentation will be made available to you, so you don't necessarily need to furiously scribble down notes about what you're seeing. We do encourage you to share your questions and thoughts about what you're hearing throughout the presentation in the chat. When using the chat function, please select the drop-down option for everyone. That will ensure that everyone sees what you're lifting up and we'll do our best to address as many of the questions as we get as possible in a discussion at the end. Closed captioning is available for today's webinar. If you would like to access that feature, please click the up arrow next to the closed captioned icon in the Zoom toolbar, then select show subtitles. If you have a technical issue, you can always chat us to get help. In that case, please select the drop-down option hosts and panelists only and a member of our team will help you with your technical issue. Finally, at the end of the webinar, you'll be asked to complete a quick survey so that we can listen to you. We want your feedback to help us plan for next year's Pulse Poll. And so now with that housekeeping done, I'm gonna turn it over to our polling team, um, which is Dave Metz and Lori Weigel. Dave is a Democratic pollster from FM3 Research, and Lori is a Republican pollster at Newbridge Strategy. They've worked with us over the course of this year to put together this poll, and they'll be sharing the results with you today. So Dave, um, feel free to take it away. Fantastic, thank you very much, Kyle, for the chance to be with you today, and to all of you for joining to learn about the findings of this year's poll. Uh, we've put together a summary of some of the key results. Uh, it's a lot of data, but hopefully you'll find it interesting. Um, we're going to move through it fairly quickly, but make sure we have a, a good chunk of time at the end for Q&A. Um, and as you've heard, and as you will hear more later on, there's a wealth of additional data that is available on the Pulse Poll website that will allow you to uh, dive deep into the opinions of subgroups within Colorado's population and look at a range of questions beyond even those that we're covering in today's briefing. I'm Dave Metz. I'm a partner with FM3 Research. I'm joined by my colleague, Lori Weigel of Newbridge Strategy. And uh, the two of us will be going back and forth as we walk through some of the key findings of this year's poll. To start with, just a little bit more about the methodology of the research, which you saw summarized in the, the video presentation a moment ago. We interviewed almost 2,500 adult residents throughout the state of Colorado. Um, we conducted the interviews between the end of July and the first couple of weeks of August, and to ensure the most diverse and representative possible sample, we conducted the interviews in both English and Spanish, on landline phones, wireless phones, and online, uh, and even emailed out postcards to addresses for whom we weren't able to obtain other uh, contact information to try to have as many different ways of inviting people to participate as we could. We also oversampled a number of subgroups of Colorado's populations, a population that make up a relatively small share of adults overall, and as a result, aren't often uh, uh, sort of explored or focused on in statewide opinion research in much detail. Um, that includes oversamples of African American Coloradans, Native American and Indigenous Coloradans, and Asian American and Pacific Islanders. We also oversampled residents of Pueblo County so that we could draw some distinctions between what residents of Pueblo think and, and what residents of, uh, of uh, El Paso County and, and Colorado Springs think. All of that sampling we then statistically weighted to make sure that our data reflects the true demographic and geographic distribution of adults in Colorado. Uh, 
And that gives us an overall margin of error of 2.7%. In some parts of the poll where we'll highlight the results among demographic subgroups, that margin of error is a little bit higher. And again, the reason there's two pollsters with you today is my firm, FM3, when we poll for candidates, only polls for Democrats. Uh, Lori's firm, Newbridge Strategy, when they poll, poll only poll for Republicans. Uh, but the two of us have been working together for a couple of decades now in designing and analyzing research from a bipartisan perspective. Um, and that is the goal with uh, the Pulse Poll. I should also note that this is the second in what is anticipated to be an annual series of polls that the foundation will conduct, which will allow us to track not just current public opinion, but to observe how it's been changing over time. We'll make some reference to what we saw in last year's poll and how it compares to what we've seen this year. We have two data points to start off with, uh, but obviously both of these polls have been conducted since the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and uh, both Lori and I have seen some other, uh, done and seen a variety of research in Colorado before that. So we're happy to try to uh, put these results in a broader uh, time context if we can. So to start off with just a little bit about some of the issues that are most on Coloradans' minds today. Um, we had a couple of questions to get at this uh, uh, sort of uh, understanding of, of what uh, issues are, are of most concern for Coloradans. The first was an open-ended question where we invited the respondents to tell us in their own words what they saw as the most important issue facing the state. And you'll see the things they mentioned most often down below. Uh, we recorded exactly what they told us and then we grouped and categorized the responses afterwards. And unlike last year, when the coronavirus was the clear top concern mentioned by about a quarter of those polled, this year the, there is no one issue that seems to be dominant. In fact, we've got five issues that between 10 and 15 percent are naming as the most important problem facing the state, including COVID, concerns about the operation of government and the political environment in Colorado, uh, population growth and related development, uh, the economy and affordable housing. All of those named by between 10 and 15% of respondents. And you'll see there's a range of other issues that uh, were volunteered as well. Certainly no shortage of things that are on Coloradans' minds. To give you a feel for the way that some of our respondents articulated their concerns, um, you'll see some sample responses listed here. Uh, lots of different issues that get touched on. We have a number of participants who are mentioning more than one thing uh, that they uh, say concerns them right now. And obviously, a lot of these responses reflect the differing circumstances in which Coloradans find themselves based on what part of the state they live in, uh, how old they are, um, their socioeconomic status, and, and of course, their political ideology as well. Now, this first question was designed to understand what one or two issues are at the, the top of Coloradans' minds. But of course, there's many issues that uh, people are concerned about or have strong opinions on. So we followed that up with a question where we offer the respondents a list of issues facing the state, which you'll see running down the left-hand side of this slide. We ask them to rate each as either an extremely, very, somewhat, or not too serious problem facing Colorado right now. And we've ranked them by the total proportion that used the top two response categories, either extremely or very serious. And those are the numbers you'll see uh, on the right-hand side here. There's a set of issues that really stand out from the list as being uh, major concerns for Coloradans right now with at least uh, seven and 10 rating them an extremely or very serious problem. Uh, and in fact, if we look at actually the, the top four issues, uh, all of which are rated a very serious problem by about two thirds of those polled, three of them have to do in some capacity with affordability, the cost of housing, the cost of living, and the cost of healthcare. Um, that clearly is one of the uh, sort of rising and, and more dominant concerns for Coloradans right now, along with homelessness, which 72% rate as a very serious problem. Uh, moving down the list, there's a number of other issues that uh, stand out here, uh, most notably mental health, the fifth item that you'll see on the list. 63% rate that a very serious problem. And one of the most striking findings from last year's survey dealt with the mental health impacts of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we had a, a sizable number of Coloradans last year who told us it had impacted their mental health. And so in this year's survey, we took a deeper dive and asked a more detailed series of questions about the kinds of mental health challenges Coloradans have faced and what steps they've taken to address them. Lori will be talking more about some of the specific data uh, in that area in just a few moments. 
Here you'll see the second tier of concerns that uh, Coloradans rank as very serious problems. In each case, we have less than half of those polled uh, rating these items as a, a very serious problem, which is not to say that they aren't concerns for Coloradans. If we add in that yellow bar, the third category of those who rate them a somewhat serious problem, it's a pretty solid majority for, uh, for each item on the list here. Um, another one that's worth noting is the second one from the top, the cost of childcare. You'll see that dark gray bar on the right is larger for this item than for all the others. That's the proportion who said they didn't know enough to offer an opinion. And I think that obviously reflects uh, households where people don't have children or grandchildren and haven't really uh, had to struggle with the issue of childcare. Among those who do have an opinion on that issue, a sizable proportion are concerned. And this is another topic that we probed in, in more detail in the survey that we'll uh, talk a little bit more about in, in a few moments. So how have the set of issues Coloradans are concerned about changed over the course of the last couple of years? We compared the proportions that rated each issue a very serious problem in 2020 with those who said the same in 2021. And we've ranked them here by the shift in concern over the course of the past year. Those cost of living issues that were at the top of the list of concerns have also gained a lot of uh, salience in the last 12 months. Um, a 15 point increase in concern about the cost of housing and a 10 point increase in concern about the cost of living, both well outside the survey's margin of error. At the same time, if you look at the bottom of this table, you'll see those issues about which concern has decreased most greatly in the same period of time. And there, it's actually uh, sort of the economy in the big picture. Harm to the economy from coronavirus and jobs in the economy more broadly uh, have, have had double digit declines in the proportion rating of a very serious problem. Some of that likely has to do with the survey's timing. When we were in the field last August, obviously it was early in the pandemic and there was a lot of uncertainty about how uh, broad and lasting its economic impacts might be. Um, while some of those concerns might have eased over time, people's concerns about the uh, financial impacts on themselves and about affordability clearly have risen. And we had a more detailed series of questions about some of the worries that Coloradans have in that regard, which we'll talk about in just a moment. There are also some interesting demographic distinctions in the level of concern that Coloradans express about a range of these issues. Uh, if we compare the results by the race or ethnicity of our survey respondents, um, you'll see some big differences here when we compare white Coloradans with Coloradans of color. Uh, in many circumstances, as you'll see in the um, bars that are highlighted in yellow, Coloradans of color express greater concern about a number of these issues than do white Coloradans. Um, that includes the cost of living, air and water pollution, crime, hunger, the health impacts of COVID, and uh, police violence and misconduct. At the same time, um, you'll also see that there is one issue where we're seeing more concern from white Coloradans than from Coloradans of color, and that's divisions between people of different political parties. Almost two thirds of white Coloradans consider that a very serious problem uh, compared to just a slim majority of Coloradans of color. But perhaps the biggest differences we see within our sample in terms of uh, concern about these issues come on partisan lines. Uh, as is the case in most aspects of our society today, Democrats and Republicans in Colorado uh, have a very different set of priorities in terms of the issues that concern them most. Um, the column running down the right-hand side of this table compares the proportion of Democrats and Republicans who view these issues as very serious problems. And you'll see a range of issues where the concern among Democrats is drastically higher than the concern among Republicans. Uh, the difference is most extreme on the issue of climate change, midway down the slide. While 82% of Democrats rated a very serious problem, making it the second highest ranked issue on this list, for Republicans, it's exactly the reverse. Um, just 18% rated a very serious problem, ranking it second from the bottom for them. And that's a 64 point gap in concern between Republicans and Democrats on this issue. Not unique to Colorado, we see the same dynamics nationwide, but it's a pretty stark divide. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, there's a big gap between Republicans and Democrats on the issue of illegal immigration, where 62% of Republicans view it as a very serious problem, compared to just 17% of Democrats who rank it as the issue about which they are least concerned of all the items on the list. 
So given that uh, the, some of the top concerns for Coloradans in this year's survey focused on affordability and the cost of living, um, we included a series of more detailed questions that focused on some of the concerns that Coloradans may feel about their own financial circumstances um, as they uh, both look back over the past year and as they look ahead to what they may expect over the next 12 months. We asked them to tell us whether compared to last year, they were uh, in a better off financially, worse off, or in about the same position. And for Coloradans as a whole, we had a slim majority, 51%, who said they're in about the same position, and then about one quarter that said they were better off, a similar number saying they were worse off. These numbers are very similar to what we saw last year when we asked the same question, just a couple of percentage points different. But while those overall numbers seem like something of a wash, um, you will see that there are some pretty stark differences based on household income. The most affluent Coloradans, those who are already most financially secure and have six-figure household incomes, uh, twice as many of them said that they were actually better off now than they were a year ago, 32% to 16%, uh, comparing those who say they're better off to those who say they're worse off. For households with incomes under $30,000 per year, the reverse was true. They are almost three times as likely to say that they are worse off uh, as opposed to better off compared to last year. And for Coloradans with uh, incomes in the middle of that range, it's roughly equal numbers saying they're better or worse off. So the overall picture is those who already were feeling some financial strain have had that strain increase financially were here. But the financial uh, expresses itself in a variety of ways for Coloradans. We asked our respondents four questions about whether they were worried about a variety of um, uh, potential economic impacts over the course of the coming year. Um, and I'll show you those on the, the next four slides here. The first was whether they're worried about not having a place to live because they couldn't afford their rent or mortgage. 21% um, of Coloradans said they were worried about that. And as you'll see on the right-hand side, it was disproportionately those who are currently unemployed and those in lower income households who had this worry. A similar dynamic was evident when we asked about uh, food security. 23% of Coloradans say that they're worried about being able to afford enough food to feed themselves and their families in the coming year. A concern that again is much more acute among those who are currently unemployed and among those households that are on the lower end of the income spectrum. In fact, a majority of households with incomes under $30,000 per year uh, saying that they're worried about being able to afford food in the year ahead. On the subject of health insurance coverage, uh, we have a sizable group of Coloradans, 27%, almost three in 10, who are telling us that they are worried about having to go without health insurance coverage at some point during the coming year. A concern that is more acute among those who are unemployed, even those who are employed part-time. Um, and then again, among uh, households with lower incomes, uh, those with incomes under $50,000 per year, almost half are worried about uh, having health insurance. And then finally, we asked our respondents if they uh, plan to be employed in the coming year, and if so, how worried they are that they may not be fully employed during the next 12 months. 16% of Coloradans tell us that they want to work, but are concerned about um, being able to find as much employment as they would like. Again, it's a little bit more lower income households who have that concern and uh, younger Coloradans uh, as well. Uh, that express that. So if we look at these four concerns together, we can group our respondents based on whether they currently are, are worried about one or more, two or more, three or more, or all four of these issues. And you'll see the proportions of Colorado's adult population on the left-hand side that fall into each of those categories. Almost half of Coloradans, 44%, are worried about at least one uh, of these uh, concerns, almost a quarter are worried about two or more. And you'll see on the right-hand side, the demographic subgroups that are most likely to uh, be feeling these financial strains. Again, it's disproportionately those in lower income households or, or those who are unemployed, but it also includes uh, Latinx Coloradans, women of color more broadly, renters, uh, those who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, uh, and those who live with a disability. So these financial pressures are not shared equally by all Coloradans, but uh, disproportionately are falling on 
uh, the groups that, uh, that we've highlighted here. Over the course of the last 12 months, Coloradans also report that they've experienced a variety of uh, pressures uh, financially. Um, almost two in five say that they've had to postpone medical or dental care. Uh, almost a quarter say that they've had their work hours cut back or their wages reduced. And then between one in 10 and two in 10 uh, report a number of other uh, challenges that they faced over the, the course of the past year. These challenges are not experienced equally by all members of the state's population. As you might expect from some of the data that we've just walked through, they are felt most acutely among uh, households with lower incomes who are disproportionately likely to have had to postpone health care, um, experience cuts in their hours or wages, had to change their living arrangements because they couldn't afford a place to live, been laid off, and then critically uh, had to skip meals because they couldn't afford food. Three out of 10 households with incomes under $30,000 per year have had that experience compared to just 1% of those at the top end of the income scale. So uh, that gives you a sense of some of the issues that are most on Coloradans' mind and a little bit of a closer look about the affordability concerns that they've expressed. I'm now gonna hand it over to Lori to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the health-related issues that we explored, both physical health and mental health. I love all the questions coming in the chat. So, <laughs> so I'll take a pause from trying to respond to all of those and, and walk through some more data. Um, thanks, Dave. I appreciate you guiding the slides for me. So yes, of course, we had to ask about vaccination rates. We asked a question last year, of course, anticipating, hoping with fingers crossed that we would have a vaccine to ask about in this year's poll. And uh, some of the dynamics really match up with what we saw last year in terms of who was saying that they would be vaccinated, as well as some dynamics for what we've seen nationally. I think all of you all have seen some of the age distinctions and have been tracking closely Colorado's vaccination rate. And our poll really backs up some of what we've seen in seven and 10 saying that yes, that they have had um, at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. They are more likely to be women because we take better care of ourselves sometimes. <laughs> they are more likely to be older, um, which very much matches with what we've seen around the country. Notably, um, uh, Black residents of Colorado were last year, when we asked them about whether or not they anticipated getting vaccinated, were somewhat more hesitant um, than other Coloradans but we see that the rates of, that, of them saying that they've had at least one dose are fairly comparable now to what we see among Latinx and Native American respondents, uh, a little bit lower than our white and uh, Asian respondents. Um, but of course, one of those dynamics that has persisted that we saw that was evidenced last year in terms of what they thought they would do and what has actually happened is a little bit um, backed up in terms of in terms of what people are telling us this year. We have nine and 10 Democrats, seven and 10 of our independent unaffiliated respondents, and then 57% of Republicans telling us that they've had at least one dose, which is obviously something that's been talked about a lot nationally as well. On the next slide, you can see that when we ask them about what they, again, <laughs> for those who have not, gotten at least one dose of the vaccine, what they anticipate doing. We do have one in 10 that are saying, well, yep, I'm going to get it as soon as I can. We have another 12% that are saying they, they are open to it, but they may want to wait a little bit longer. Um, but unfortunately, we have a, a majority of those who have not received a dose of the vaccine saying that they definitely are not planning to get it. And it does, again, tend to fall along party lines, especially the, among those who are the most conservative. Um, notably, I, I saw someone mention Medicaid. We're collapsing that in with Medicare under, under government programs, but the uninsured were less likely to have gotten vaccinated and are saying that they're definitely not going to get vaccinated at higher rates there. So um, some significant differences. We also wanted to ask them among those who are a parent or guardian of a child under the age of 18, which describes their plans on vaccination. And certainly some kids were not eligible yet, um, but we had about one in five saying all their children were already vaccinated. 
Um, and then another two and five that planned on getting vaccinated, it's a little bit fewer that are saying they're hesitant to, to vaccinate their children, although some are not sure at this time as well. So some interesting dynamics in terms of, in terms of vaccination and um, what people are planning to do both for themselves and other members of their household. On the next slide and moving into another aspect that's certainly been, that we saw sort of, um, you know, directly one of the key findings from last year's survey was really just the mental health impacts that, um, that people were experiencing during this very unusual time. And we wanted to dig a lot more into that this time and really get past just sort of a broad question and understand exactly how Coloradans were being impacted. So on the next slide, you can see that when we asked uh, more specifically for some different ways that people, uh, different experiences people might have shared over the last year, we asked them, we had a majority of Coloradans telling us that they um, had experienced anxiety, about two in five, greater than two in five, saying that they'd experienced excessive worrying or difficulty focusing in the last year. And then more than one in three telling us that they'd experienced depression, grief or loss, or difficulty connecting with friends and family. And certainly we could have asked about even more different types of experiences, but for time's sake, this is what we were able to cover. And really it's significant proportions that are telling us they've experienced something along these, uh, some sort of mental health challenge over the last year. Um, it does vary though, depending on who we're talking to. And on the next slide, you can see that one of the subgroups that really stands out was that uh, particularly women and I use these terms very loosely these days as I've moved into different categories of my age, relatively younger women were more likely to tell us that they had experienced um, pretty much every single one of these particular uh, mental health challenges, with especially anxiety, difficulty focusing, excessive worrying, significantly higher among those younger female respondents. But also another group of, of women in Colorado that said they were more likely to experience it on the next slide, um, Dave, thanks for <laughs> keeping this going, was women of color. And um, not always as significantly higher rates than, than white women, but we certainly saw it on a number of these factors. Um, excessive worrying, for example, was significantly higher there. Um, depression was somewhat higher, as was grief or loss. So, a range of different mental health challenges that certainly significant proportions of all Coloradans are telling us they're experiencing, but everyone's experience may be a little bit different based on that. And then on the next slide, you can see that um, we also saw that lesbian, gay, bisexual respondents were more likely to tell us they were experiencing certain mental health challenges, as well as those who live with one or more disabilities. Um, at significantly greater proportions. On the next slide, one more. Um, and certainly everyone's experience, as Dave talked about a lot of the financial stresses, we certainly see a strong relationship to some of the mental health challenges as well. So those who said their financial situation over the past year had deteriorated or those who had been laid off over the course of the last year were also more likely to tell us that they were experiencing a number of these different mental health challenges. So again, uh, a great deal of relationship there. We also wanted to see um, what folks were doing about that and who they had reached out to over the course of the last year as they experienced some of those challenges. So um, the greatest proportion, almost three in five, said that they had spoken to family or friends. About half said they had reached out to someone who had similar concerns to them. And then in fact, three in 10, you know, more than one in four told us that they had reached out to a health professional. Those folks were more likely to be some of those, again, there's some relationship here, some of those who were experiencing a number of these different challenges, such as younger women, lesbian, gay, and bi folks, or those living with um, a number, uh, one or more disabilities. Um, but there was also a little bit of partisanship, those who said they were very liberal, younger Democrats, 
more likely to say they reached out to a mental health professional um, to talk about some of those mental health challenges. So um, certainly one of the stresses that we have seen um, uh, probably on many of our Zoom screens as we've gone about our, our lives over the last year and certainly in talking to, to Coloradans over the last year, we've heard a lot about childcare and parenting challenges. So maybe that's what's contributing to some of that uh, stress and anxiety that we heard about. Um, but we wanted to dig in more on, uh, on specific challenges that, that parents and those, uh, the child care needs were, were experiencing over the course of this last year and that might anticipate in the future. So on the next slide, um, we asked respondents, again, some questions a little bit similar to, to a, a little bit more of a catch-all than what we asked them about um, about themselves, but wanted to see among those who are parents or guardians of children under the age of 18, did they feel their child or any of their children had experienced uh, mental health strain? In fact, we had half that said their children had experienced some sort of mental health strain, such as anxiety, loneliness, or stress. We had more than two in five telling us that at least one of their children had struggled with school or learning over the course of the last year or had difficulty building or maintaining friendships. It about one in four tell us that they had postponed medical or dental care when it came to their child. And then it was in the single digits that told us that their children had to skip meals because they couldn't afford food. It was significantly lower than what we heard, <clears throat> somewhat lower than what we heard them telling us about their own experience, but still a significant, you know, quite a few. Uh, were telling us that about that experience. And of course, again, there were some that experienced things differently over the course of the last year. Notably for mental health strain, it was actually higher among white respondents, among Native Americans, telling us that their children had experienced some of those mental health strains. Um, we also saw higher rates of telling us they were struggling with school or learning among white respondents and Hispanic respondents about their kids. And then difficulty building and maintaining friendships was higher than those white uh, respondents as well. So a number of different challenges, distinctions from what we saw overall based on race and ethnicity. We also saw on the next slide that we heard a little bit different things from, and I use these terms loosely, from moms than dads. I think that's the next slide. See if you flip forward for me. There we go, you might be getting stuck in the chat sometimes. Um, that um, those moms are telling us their kids are, are more likely than, again, using those terms loosely, than dads to tell us that they felt their children were experiencing mental health strain, were struggling with school or learning, or told us, and much more likely to tell us that they had postponed medical or dental care for those kids, uh, for their children over the course of the last year. Um, if we move to the next slide, we can also see this broken out by, um, whoops, where did we go? Yep, okay, thank you. Um, we also, sorry, we asked them if they had, um, based on the fact that they experienced some challenges over the course of the last year, how worried were they that the impact of those experiences was having on their children's health and well being? And in fact, we had one in five of these parents telling us that they were very worried about the impact that those challenges was having. But an even greater number, more than seven in 10 collectively, telling us that they were at least somewhat worried um, about the overall impact over the course of the last year. Certainly as a mom, I can tell you, I share some of those concerns. So uh, we were definitely seeing that bear out in our data. Um, and then of course, uh, we were asking them about their children's experiences, but of of course, there were things that they as parents may have been worried about themselves and may have been experiencing related to childcare. And we'll break these down by age of the child and a few other characteristics in a second. But overall, we saw that two in five were telling us that they had found it more difficult to balance childcare and other responsibilities. We had one in four telling us they'd been named, unable to find childcare for all the hours they needed it, or that they missed out or declined a professional opportunity or taken on uh, or not taken on more responsibility at work because of a lack of childcare. And 
just slightly fewer than one in four told us they've been unable to find childcare that is affordable. Um, so again, I hinted at this, but if you move to the next slide, we can see that there are some distinctions. So first of all, based on the age of the child, those with the youngest children, um, having a child in age five or under face some of the greatest challenges, especially in terms of balancing childcare and other responsibilities, um, but a little bit uh, as well in terms of 10 points higher being unable to find childcare for all the hours they needed it, or telling us that they missed out or declined um, basically work opportunities because of a lack of childcare. And then uh, they were the most likely, of course, to also cite affordability as a concern. You can also see some gender distinctions uh, among parents as well. And, um, and so that's, you know, again, I won't go through every single number, but again, that's worth noting too. Uh, the quote unquote moms were experiencing this a little bit differently. And then based on race and ethnicity, there were some notable distinctions that we wanted to call out. Um, among people of color, they were more likely to tell us that they had found it more difficult to balance childcare and other responsibilities, um, as well as saying that they may have missed out on some, some work advancement or opportunities of work based on uh, a lack of childcare in particular, um, and been unable to find childcare that's affordable. So definitely some uh, distinctions based on that as well. And if you look at parents of color by, uh, by gender, that's where we see some of the starkest differences. Those again, just as we saw before in terms of feeling like their children were um, having some different experiences, we saw that um, women of color, par women parents of color were more likely to tell us that they were having difficulty in terms of balance difficulty finding all the childcare they needed at all the times, and then were having difficulty um, or having to decline opportunities at work um, because of a lack of childcare. So those really stand out. On the next slide, I'm going to hand it back to Dave to talk about another section of the survey um, that some of which we saw some interesting um, dynamics from last year and wanted to repeat and see if those held up in this year's survey. Great, thank you, Lori. So um, we started last year's survey with questions to explore the degree to which Coloradans perceive um, that people in the state receive unfair treatment in a variety of different areas as a result of their racial or ethnic background. Um, obviously last summer, immediately before the survey went in the field in the wake of George Floyd's killing, uh, there was a, a greatly heightened national attention around some of these issues. Um, we wanted to come back to some of these questions and expand them in this year's survey to see whether the sentiments we saw then had held steady, expanded, um, or had receded at all. And by and large, what the data shows us is that Coloradans do perceive significant inequities in the unfair treatment that people in the state receive based on their race and ethnicity, and those sentiments have not diminished in any meaningful way since last year. The way we approached this question was to ask respondents whether they believe that compared to white Coloradans, four different communities of color within the state received unfair treatment in three different uh, issue areas. Uh, the communities of color we identified were Black and African American Coloradan, Hispanic and Latinx Coloradans, Indigenous and Native American Coloradans, and Asian American and Pacific Islander Coloradans. And the three areas we asked about or whether they received uh, disproportionately unfair treatment by police, poor quality or inadequate health care, or were treated unfairly when seeking to rent or buy a home. The next slides I'll walk through will show you the perceptions of all Coloradans about the way each of those four uh, racial or ethnic subgroups are treated, um, and then show the perceptions among different racial and ethnic groups about uh, each of those sets of questions. So it's a lot of data to navigate through, but um, hopefully you'll see the, the pattern we've set up here and, and uh, there's a number of interesting findings. So this initial question is asking perceptions of the way that black Coloradans are treated compared to white Coloradans. And there's a broad consensus that they are more likely to be treated unfairly by police, uh, more likely to receive poor quality or inadequate health care, and more likely to be treated unfairly when seeking to rent or buy a home. 
those perceptions hold true across racial and ethnic subgroups within Colorado's population. Um, they are more acute among Black Coloradans themselves, but notably other communities of color within the state, Asian and Pacific Islander Coloradans, Hispanic Coloradans, Native American Coloradans, all disproportionately believe that Black Coloradans are subject to unfair treatment. Um, white Coloradans hold the same view, but not to the same degree that Coloradans of color do. When we ask those same questions uh, about uh, Hispanic and Latinx Coloradans, you'll see the responses here. Um, oops, sorry. Um, in each case, we've got about half of those polled telling us that Hispanic Coloradans are more likely than white Coloradans to be treated unfairly by police, receive poor quality or inadequate health care, or experience unfair treatment in seeking a place to live. And again, uh, those sentiments largely cut across subgroups within Colorado's population. Uh, once again, individual communities of color are more likely to perceive that Hispanic Coloradans experience unfair treatment than our white Coloradans, uh, but there aren't dramatic differences between individual communities of color in those perceptions. Uh, this year was the first time that the survey included a question asking about uh, Native American and Indigenous Coloradans and the degree to which they are treated unfairly. And as you'll see here, the perception among Coloradans at large is similar to the perception of uh, the treatment that Hispanic Coloradans receive. With about half of those polled saying Native American and Indigenous people in the state experience unfair treatment in each of the three areas that we asked about. And again, that perception largely cuts across individual communities of color, um, with each of them uh, having majorities in almost all cases saying that Native American and Indigenous Coloradans of color experience those uh, types of unfair treatment, slightly uh, less of that perception among white Coloradans, but it's still about half that hold that view. And then of particular interest in this year's survey uh, was perceptions of uh, unfair treatment received by Asian American and Pacific Islander Coloradans. Given that the last year uh, there has been a lot of attention to increases in hate crimes and uh, various forms of discrimination and bias directed against the Asian American community, uh, we were interested in seeing whether the numbers were different than what we saw last year in this regard. Um, and by and large, the numbers uh, were pretty close to the same as what we saw in last year's poll. Coloradans are less likely to perceive that Asian American and Pacific Islander Coloradans experience unfair treatment disproportionately uh, than is the case for other communities of color in the state. Only about three in 10 Coloradans believe that Asian American residents of the state are treated unfairly by police, uh, receive worse health care, or are treated unfairly in seeking a place to live. Those perceptions, as you'll see in the uh, fourth column on this slide, um, are greater among Asian American Coloradans themselves. They are more likely than members of other uh, ethnic and racial groups to say, yes, Asian American residents of this state are treated unfairly in these areas. But interest, and, and I would also note those numbers have increased since last year. Um, Asian American residents of the state are more likely to perceive bias against them than was the case in last year's survey. At the same time, uh, even among Asian American and Pacific Islander Coloradans, if you remember the numbers from the prior, slide, prior slides, they themselves are more likely to perceive that African Americans, Hispanic, and Native American Coloradans receive unfair treatment than Asian Americans themselves do. Um, so there's a lot of interesting dynamics here um, uh, as we look at the data over time and, and among these different subgroups. Uh, but by and large, the overall numbers, as I mentioned before, very similar to where they were in, in last year's survey, suggesting that certainly there has not been any reduction in concern uh, about unfair treatment uh, along these lines over the course of the past 12 months. So the final section of the survey dealt with some potential steps that state government might take to address some of the concerns that we've documented that Coloradans uh, have in all of the data that we've shared with you so far. We offered the respondents descriptions of six policy approaches that state government might take to address some of these issues. Um, these were described at a very high level. Uh, we didn't go into a lot of detail about how exactly the policies might be implemented or paid for. 
But we did make clear the kinds of steps that might be taken to uh, affect change, whether it means changing laws or regulations or increased state spending in order to address them. And each of the six policy proposals that we tested here had broad support. We had at least two thirds who were in favor of each one. Um, and in most cases, or, or at least half the cases, we had an outright majority who told us that they strongly supported each of these policies. That's the case for the top three items that you'll see listed on the slide, um, providing more state funded mental health and substance use services, uh, making it easier for people to uh, afford health care, and um, ensuring that uh, Coloradans who uh, are experiencing hunger uh, have better access to food. Now, we talked before about the degree to which there are partisan divisions in perceptions of a lot of the major issues facing the state. Um, refreshingly, the, while there were partisan divisions, they weren't that stark when we look at overall support for these policies. Majorities of Democrats, independents, and Republicans um, supported each of the six policies we tested, save one. That item at the bottom of the slide about increasing uh, government efforts to stimulate the economy and create jobs, just under half of Republicans voiced support for that policy. Um, but other than that, majorities across party lines uh, thought all of these were a good idea. The bigger differences we see along party lines are not when we look at overall support, but when we look at the strength of that support. Uh, this slide breaks out the proportion of our survey respondents who said that they strongly supported each of the policies uh, presented here. And as you'll see, among Democrats, we have solid majorities that are strongly in favor of each of the policies we tested, in particular those top four that you'll see on the list where at least seven in 10 Democrats offered strong support. Um, independence, there was more variation. Two policies we had majorities expressing strong support for. Um, including making health insurance more affordable and increasing access to mental health and substance use services. Uh, Republicans are a bit more ambivalent. As I said before, majorities were also out of the six, but one third strong support. Any of them. And then finally, um, we also broke out the results by region, as you'll see here. Um, and the level of strong support for each of these policies cuts across every region of the state. Total support for each of the policies was a majority across the board in, in each region. Uh, the intensity of support is somewhat stronger in the Denver metro region, and that's likely a reflection of partisanship. Um, more of those Democrats who are more enthusiastic about these ideas tend to be concentrated in uh, that part of the state. So uh, that summarizes most of the, the key findings of the uh, uh, research here. Um, I know that's a lot for you to absorb in a very short period of time, but as we've discussed and will discuss, um, all of this data is available and more for you to, to look at on the Pulse Poll website. Um, and I will hand it back to Kyle now. Uh, it's, we can uh, talk about some of the next steps and, and answer some questions. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you. Take a breath. You've just seen a mountain of information in a very short amount of time and all that. But now we're getting to what's my favorite part of the webinar, which is a chance for me to sound smart by lifting up the questions that we heard from you all in the chat as well. And so thank you to everybody who's been chatting in questions, reflections on what you've heard throughout the presentation so far. Please keep those coming. We're keeping an eye on the chat box and we're going to lift up um, some of the themes of what we've heard from you already as you've been digesting the data. Um, from what you've heard so far today. Um, one of the things that I'll start with is a theme that I saw in a number of questions that we were getting in the chat, which was essentially, can we get data specifically about a certain group of Coloradans and what we heard from this year's um, data? And, and my understanding, Dave and Lori, is that we feel confident reporting data for any subpopulation of Coloradans where we got at least 100 respondents in this year's poll. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the reasoning why we draw that cutoff line at 100 respondents? And then I'll speak specifically to how that shows up um, in the questions that we were getting about whether or not we can report data for LGBT Coloradans, including transgender Coloradans, and why we were just reporting data on LGB Coloradans this year. Um, so the there ultimately there isn't any particular magic to the the number of 100, but what that does is get our margin of error for that subgroup under 10 percent. And usually in in our analysis, we think that's a reasonable cutoff to look at for 
data that we consider reliable enough to, to draw some uh, meaningful distinctions. Um, so uh, we recommend that you know, in analyzing subgroups, we do focus on those that have a, a sample size of at least 100. And given the overall size of our sample here, um, while it may not get down to county level data, for most age and and uh, regional and and uh, ethnic groupings, um, it's it's a robust enough sample size that we can look at many many subgroups within the population on that basis. Yeah, and that's uh, thank you for that, Dave. And that's part of the reason why we invest in such a large overall sample size for Pulse every year is that we're able to report out data for a number of populations or groups of Coloradans that you don't necessarily see. Um, sort of represented in data samples from other surveys that happen in our state. So the ability to talk about the experiences, the perspectives of AAPI Coloradans is something that we're excited to be able to lift up this year because we were able to reach that 100 respondent threshold for them. Um, we did ask about sexual orientation and gender identity on two different questions on this year's survey. We uh, crossed that 100 respondent threshold for um, respondents who reported um, being lesbian, gay, or bisexual. So that's why you saw data in some of the slides for LGB Coloradans, where there were interesting patterns in what we saw in that data. Unfortunately, we did not get enough respondents this year who reported being transgender or non-binary to be able to report data that we felt would be um, representative of a very diverse population of transgender and non-binary um, Coloradans as well. And that's part of the reason why we keep ourselves to that 100 respondent standard for being able to report out data, because we know that none of the groups of Coloradans that we're reporting on are monolithic. And so we want to get a sort of critical mass of respondents' perspectives from any one of those groups to have some confidence that we're actually reflecting something that might be a pattern in that population. Uh, we got a number of questions about the, ge the geographic breakdowns that are possible in this year's data. Um, and there are a variety of different ways that you can slice and dice geography and how we ask where people live um, in this year's data set. So for example, you're able to look at respondents from rural Colorado compared to urban or suburban Colorado. You're able to look at respondents for, um, who report living in a big city or a small town or a rural area. And we are able to report data for any county on its own where we cross that 100 respondent threshold for a specific county. And um, we'll walk through a demonstration at the end of today's call uh, of where you can find this kind of information in the data dashboard that's available on the website. Um, Dave and Lori, uh, we were getting a few questions um, sort of back at the beginning of the survey when you were touching on sort of the theme of top issues on the minds of Coloradans this year. Um, one of the uh, questions that, that you lifted up in sort of the crosstabs um, by party affiliation were some differences of opinion about um, concern about illegal immigration. And on the slide, we talked about those differences in terms of party affiliation. Uh, but we were getting um, some questions about whether or not there were other sort of ways of looking at groups of Coloradans where there seemed to be patterns in whether or not folks thought of illegal immigration as a, a top concern in our state beyond party affiliation. Yeah, partisanship was definitely the one area where we saw the biggest distinction. Um, obviously, that relates to a number of other demographic variables. So it was higher among the older respondents, white respondents, you know, more likely to say it was a serious problem. I think someone else asked if it had come up as a, as a, when we just asked people to volunteer, what was the top problem facing, uh, facing the state? And it was in, you know, very, very low single digits in terms of people volunteering that. So it wasn't top of mind, but when we raised it, it tended to provoke that more partisan response. Um, I'll also say, I think someone was asking about food and hunger, and certainly we saw that come up as something people had experienced. But again, it wasn't one of those very top of mind concerns about the overall state that we were seeing things um, by far more related to uh, affordability issues just generally um, and cost of housing and homelessness specifically, um, but also just, you know, sort of this, <laughs> the things that people tend to chat about in their backyard barbecue or the things that we tend to get in, in that overall uh, top problem question about, you know, politics and government today and things like that. Yeah, 
Thanks for that, Lori. Um, we, we received a number of questions about the information that we have from this year's poll touching on mental health and well-being of Coloradans. And we asked a number of questions about that both last year and this year um, because it was one of the real themes that we heard in the 2020 edition of the Pulse poll as well. Um, one of the questions that we got about this year's data was um, if we have any insight into why folks may not have um, talked to a mental health professional about their concerns. You, know, you may recall from that section of the presentation that we asked a series of questions sort of identifying specific mental health challenges that folks may have experienced. And anybody who said yes, we asked a follow-up question asking if they had talked to either a friend or family member, somebody who may have experienced a similar concern to theirs, and finally, uh, a health professional of some kind as well. And um, of the, the folks who reported any of those, the, the lowest report was for folks actually reaching out to a mental health professional. Um, Dave, I think you responded in a chat just to the host and all that about some information that we had from last year's survey with an open-ended question we asked that, that touched on that theme. So I, I was going to ask you to sort of lift that up, what we heard last year in that more broad open-ended question for folks who reported difficulty accessing, accessing services for mental health um, about what we heard last year about that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's an important question. And unfortunately, we didn't have time to ask it again this year, but we did ask it in last year's survey. And there were three main factors that respondents mentioned as reasons they hadn't sought uh, help from a, a mental health professional. Um, the first was cost, that they're in, either they were uninsured or their insurance didn't cover it and it was simply too expensive for them to afford that treatment. Uh, the second was simply finding an available professional to help them. For many people who might have sought such help, they didn't really know where to begin looking for it, or in some parts of the state, um, said that they didn't have ready access to a mental health professional in their community. And the third factor that many mentioned was uh, related to stigma, a sense that asking for help, you know, acknowledging that they were struggling with mental health issues, uh, might cause friends or family members or others to look at them differently. And so um, they chose not to elevate it by, by seeking professional help. So all three of those factors were things that seemed to play into um, Coloradans choosing not to seek help when they experienced these strains. And um, obviously, as, you know, as Lori documented, those strains have only gotten more severe over the course of the past 12 months. So sticking with the, the theme of, you know, sort of top concerns, top priorities that, that popped on this year's survey, um, we did see some pretty substantial shifts in the numbers um, for topics related to housing and homelessness on this year's survey compared to last year's survey. I mean, we got a question about um, the data that's available regarding, to home, regarding homelessness as an issue in Colorado as well. So, Dave or Lori, could you talk a little bit more about um, what we heard this year and what, if anything, strikes you as different between this year and some of the ways that we looked at that last year? Yeah, I can start just, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, there were a number of places where we actually saw a striking lack of distinction based on where people were in the state. Um, you know, cost of housing was, was a major issue no matter where someone lived and even no matter what their income was interestingly. But when we asked about homelessness, we definitely saw the Denver metro area stood out. We had nearly four in five, 79 percent, telling us they perceived homelessness as an extremely or very serious problem. It was um, somewhat lower in, uh, in uh, Larimer and Weld County at 65 percent and closer to the like, mid-50s on the eastern plains or western slope. So it was definitely an area where um, where one lived uh, had an impact. I should note Colorado Springs uh, and, and Pueblo County was, was nearly as high as the Denver metro area, so that's worth noting. Um, and then in terms of distinction from the year before, I think we saw certainly an, an elevation of overall concern about homelessness uh, in terms of the numbers, not shockingly, uh, given that some of the inflationary concerns about cost of living and cost of housing. Um, so I think it's all sort of bundled up a little bit together in terms of, uh, in terms of that elevation of that overall concern. Someone's asking another question related to, we could talk all day about just one of these questions, couldn't we? <laughs> so, uh, so we can try and find the urban rural 
but yeah, that, that's definitely part of it. It's, it's not entirely, there's some education distinctions and even partisan distinctions when it comes to perceptions and, and concern about homelessness from what we're seeing in this data. Other questions, Kyle, you wanted to lift up? I know we have a million. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so I, I, I thankfully have some colleagues helping to sort of sort the questions for me. And um, if you aren't paying attention to the chat, we are responding to a number of this informational clarifications and all that in the chat box as well. So keep your eye on those and please do keep your questions coming. Um, another uh, theme of questions that we got was around uh, what we asked about vaccination for COVID-19 this year. Um, and uh, I want to point out and remind folks that, you know, Pulse is a snapshot in time. We conducted this year's survey the very tail end of July and then the first couple of weeks of August. Um, and then if you flash forward to today, it may feel like a, a different world when it comes to vaccination as a number of things have happened related to the pandemic and vaccination policy and, and other things like that. Um, even since uh, a few weeks ago when we were conducting the survey and had it out in the field as well. So, Vaccination is one of those very fluid situations where the timing of a survey um, could impact the, the results and the data of what we hear. Um, but I do want to lift up that the Colorado Health Foundation has done other um, research in um, both quantitative and qualitative ways to help us to better understand the attitudes, the perceptions of folks of, in Colorado and how they're thinking about the COVID-19 vaccine. So I believe one of my colleagues is going to put out into the chat box a link to some information um, that lives on the Colorado Health Foundation's website where you could go even deeper into what we've heard from Coloradans through focus groups, deeper qualitative information, where we focus specifically on the, the perceptions, the, 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 the experiences, the things that people of color in Colorado are thinking about when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so look for that link in the chat. We have a number of resources beyond what we were able to ask and a limited number of questions on just that one topic and Pulse this year as well. But for Lori and Dave, um, a theme in the questions that I, I heard and saw in the chat about the, the vaccination questions that we did ask on Pulse this year is really understanding um, the, the folks in Colorado who are not yet vaccinated and what's correlated with um, among just that subset of Coloradans, which is roughly 25% of Coloradans, um, you know, what was associated with folks being potentially open to getting vaccinated um, at some point in time and what was associated with the folks who were essentially saying, um, I'm a hard no, I, I'm not interested in getting the COVID-19 vaccine. And I know that you sort of showed a slide about that, but what struck you as you looked at that data about who's potentially open to it, that they may have questions, they may have concerns or access issues they need to work through, and who was thinking, you know, definitely not for the COVID vaccine, at least as of a few weeks ago? I think, um, you know, there's sort of a distinction between those who are uh, hesitant to getting the vaccine and those who are resistant to getting the vaccine. And this divide is something that we're seeing become more pronounced nationally as vaccination rates increase and the set of uh, people who are unvaccinated is, is growing smaller. Um, as Lori went through, about half of all unvaccinated Coloradans say they definitely will not get the vaccine. And um, Speaking broadly, and Lori should amend this if, if, uh, if she sees something different, but um, it is more ideological distinctions that define the people who are definitely going to get uh, not get vaccinated. You remember they are much more likely to identify as very conservative, much more likely to be people who attend religious services on a weekly basis, much more likely to be Republicans. Whereas some of the groups with lower rates of vaccination, like younger Coloradans and uninsured Coloradans, um, seem to be more hesitant than resistant. Uh, it may well be that because the vaccine has not been available to them for as long of a period of time, uh, if they're younger, they may perceive that they're at less risk to their health. Um, and so they, uh, they simply haven't gotten vaccinated, but may still be open to hearing the case made that they should, uh, should get vaccinated. Um, those seem to be the places where the, the lines are, are starkest. Yeah, we're definitely seeing, for example, people of color and those under 30 that are more likely to be in that sort of hesitant group um, that are even you know, quite likely to say, I'm going to get it as soon as I can. I don't know where what they've been doing. <laughs> they've been busy all summer. So, um, so there's definitely, uh, they are more, I'd say, in the hesitant category versus the sort of, you know, locked in. Once you get to uh, and again, there's fewer of them, but say seniors, for example, that are have not gotten the vaccine 
they are in the resistant category. They are saying that you're definitely not going to get it. So I think it's just partly, it's just sort of this phased in approach has, has impacted some of the wait and see. Um, and, and again, there's been, I think Pew just released some national uh, data that was quite insightful more into why that is and what other experiences they'd had, but the folks that are resistant are fairly locked in. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, another uh, theme of questions that we're getting is around um, the, the questions that we asked this year about inviting people to think back over the last 12 months and things that they may have skipped out on or, or given up in the last 12 months that could have an impact on their health and well-being. So we asked some questions about whether or not folks had skipped meals, if they had gone or delayed medical or dental care, and all that as well. So one of the things that we were interested in is like asking folks to think ahead for the next 12 months. And you saw some data about what folks are worried about when they think about the future. But we also had this theme of questions about, you know, just looking backwards over the last year, um, what have you, what's actually shown up in your behaviors in your day-to-day -day life that might be having an impact on your health and well-being. And we got a number of questions, um, just curious about some of the breakdowns or some of the, the patterns that we saw when you think about those questions about, you know, skipping meals, having to move um, because you couldn't afford your housing situation um, and postponing medical or dental care, um, both for the adults who answered the survey, but we also asked that in some ways um, about whether those experiences had translated to their kids as well. So could you talk a little bit more about some of the, the demographic factors or some of the other things that you saw correlated with those kinds of experiences that Colorado's reported from the last 12 months? Yeah, I mean, we touched on some of those during the presentation. I think the, the biggest correlations were socioeconomic. It was really income more than anything else that drove the, the prevalence of those uh, experiences. And in particular, households with incomes under $50,000 per year, um, as well as those who uh, lacked health insurance or were currently unemployed, um, significantly more likely to have reported experiencing some of those uh, pressures or, or challenges or disruptions. Um, that more than, you know, factors like, uh, uh, you know, sort of gender or region of the state um, seemed to be the thing that was driving it. Although obviously there are some, you know, correlations between those, those variables. I think we need to also note that postponed medical or dental care may not have been necessarily always an access issue. It, it may have just been a, how comfortable do I feel um, <laughs> going out in public almost. And so, you know, there, there could be some, uh, a little bit of uh, leading of interpretations of that in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of that particular item. Yeah, and that's, a, that's an excellent point, Lori, and something that I need to sort of caution and discipline myself about um, every time I look at information like this, um, the, part of the power of polling and, and asking these kinds of questions of a broad range of people is it gives us a lot of insight into the patterns of what people are experiencing or what they might be thinking. Um, but it's really limited in sort of peeling back the surface of that and answering some questions about why, what's driving that as well. Um, so uh, that is one of the limitations of this kind of data. And that brings me to another theme of questions we're beginning in the chat is, you know, folks curious about like what's driving <laughs> some of these things is, um, in terms of, you know, explanations for some of the patterns that we're lifting up in this year's data as well. And so I, I do want to sort of underline what Lori said there about that's one of the, the drawbacks of this kind of exercise, this way of listening. But if you were on at the beginning of the webinar, you heard me talk about how the Colorado Health Foundation invests in lots of different ways of listening to folks. And we encourage you to do the same. We, we encourage you to use this as a beginning of conversations as something that sparks your curiosity and hopefully drives you to ask a lot more questions and to listen a lot more um, in your communities, across communities in Colorado as well, because um, this kind of listening can teach us a lot of things, but there's a lot that it can't teach us. And a lot of that falls in that category of why explaining sort of like the deeper roots of some of these patterns that we're seeing here. Um, we did get a number of questions about sort of methodological kinds of things, and I want to lift up something that one of my colleagues um, put a link in the chat to recently, which is an FAQ document that we've posted on the Pulse website that sort of lifts up the hood of the methodology behind this survey, talks about some of the questions that we received during the chat because these are common ones, 
um, to understand, for example, um, how we find the people <laughs> who responded to this year's poll, what that invitation looked like, what some of the limitations of those methodologies are as well, and then also some of the ways that we might be investing in or sort of lifting up what we're hearing from Coloradans at the Colorado Health Foundation and other ways where we could have a deeper conversation as well. Um, Dave and Lori, uh, one of the other themes and the, the questions uh, that we're getting in the chat is, how did we decide what we asked this year on this year's survey? Um, I see Dave smiling. I see Lori smiling. Um, this is a vigorous debate <laughs> among the, the Pulse poll team because we try to be respectful of the time of everybody who responds to this question. We don't want to keep people on the phone or an online survey for more than 20 minutes or so of their time. So we have to limit ourselves um, to not everything that we're curious about and to really focus in on the types of questions where this kind of listening actually can be useful. Um, so again, like, what are people experiencing? What are they thinking? But a little less about the why because we're limited with this methodology and what it can teach us about that. Um, I will say for folks who are interested, this is an annual poll, and this is the second year of the Colorado Pulse Poll. So you saw Dave and Lori in the presentation lift up some examples where we kept questions from year over year. So we asked the same question in 2021 that we asked in 2020, so we were able to report that comparative data to notice if there were any trends over time. Was this something where we saw higher responses, lower responses when we compared apples to apples, what we asked this year to what we asked last year? As we go forward into future years of Pulse, it will continue to be a tough question about what questions do we ask um, in each year's survey. Um, we're going to try to hold some space on the survey every year so that we can do that year-over-year -year analysis of trends over time for some questions. But we're also going to reserve space um, to ask questions that feel particularly relevant or that we're not seeing in other data sets or other ways that we see um, that the thinking, the experiences of Coloradans lifted up by what other people might be researching or listening to in Coloradans' um, sort of day-to-day -day experiences as well. Um, so stay tuned for future years about um, more comparative data as we have more years of pulse under our belts of being able to track those trends over time for some things. But we are keeping in mind that like we want to stay relevant. Uh, we want to sort of be mindful of, of asking stuff that feels sort of appropriate to what's on people's minds in Colorado. And part of the method behind the madness of how we make those tough calls within the Pulse poll team is what Dave lifted up in the very beginning of the presentation, which was opening up the survey with a broad open-ended question where we ask people without leading the witness, you know, what do you think is the most important things happening in Colorado? Like what concerns you? Um, and we've looked at that data from last year to inform the stuff where we ask um, questions or a series of questions on this year. And so we'll be continuing to sort of do that loop year over year as we look back on those open-ended questions, hold that up against some of the deeper conversations that we at the Colorado Health Foundation are, have the opportunity, the privilege to have with folks across the state of Colorado throughout the year to be able to land on a set of questions um, that we hope creates a, a good set of information that's relevant and useful and interesting to a broad section of folks here in Colorado. Um, when we close out today's webinar, we are going to um, put a question to you all, everybody who participated in this survey, um, about what you would like to see on next year's survey. Help us to make that really tough decision because this is a, a conversation where no two of our minds think alike. We're all curious about different things, and it's always tough to edit it down to, again, a survey that's um, a respectful use of people's time when they're answering the survey um, for next year. Um, we appreciated everybody's questions uh, during the, the conversation that you submitted during the chat today. Hopefully, we were able to get to a lot of the, the major themes, at least, and what people were wondering about from today's presentation. But before we wrap up, I do want to sort of lift up um, some of the resources that we um, have made available um, to look deeper at the questions, the data from this year's poll that's really of interest to you, and that is on the Colorado Pulse poll website. So one of my colleagues is now sharing his screen, um, which is uh, the website for copulsepoll.org, and this is where you can go on your own odyssey through the data from this year's Pulse Poll. So uh, my colleague is scrolling down to the results page of this year's survey um, and showing you what our interactive dashboard that we've built for this year's poll looks like. So if you're interested in a particular set of questions, a theme um, that we asked about this year, those are those blue tabs on the right-hand side of the Pulse Poll website. 
So if you're interested, say, in affordable housing and what we heard about, what we asked about with affordable housing or healthcare um, access and cost, you'll pull up, um, you'll click on that, and then you'll get sort of this graphic representation of what that data looks like for those questions for this year. And if you go to either of the columns on the right or the left, you're able to click on different ways of looking at demographics or subsections of the folks who responded to this year's poll. So if you're particularly interested in the breakdown of a set of questions by income, for example, you would click on one of the tabs in that income column on the right side of there, and that would pull up and filter all the results of what you see. If you're interested, for example, just in um, looking at what this data looked like if we're zeroing in on the folks living on low income in the state of Colorado. We've built this dashboard so that you can look at the, all of the questions from a, a variety of different demographic factors where, again, we have that critical mass of sample size of more than 100 respondents to be able to report the data, the experiences of what we heard from that group of Coloradans. But this is a really powerful tool that allows you to explore, to go deep on the data that's most interesting to you. I do want to note that we have both this website and this data dashboard available in both English and Spanish language this year. Um, so you're able to um, look at the data in both English and Spanish language as well. And we've got a number of questions today, as we always do on these webinars, about whether the slides will be available, whether the recording will be available, and the answer to that is yes. Um, on this Pulse Poll website, you can already download the slides that you just saw in today's presentation, um, as well as um, different ways of looking at the key findings, um, the top line results, um, which means all of the questions exactly as they were worded and all of the responses that we saw um, from the survey respondents overall. That's the top line results tab. The cross tabs, which is right next to that, is where you can look at those sort of segment by segment, population by population looks at each of the, each of the questions and the responses that we saw. If you wanted to lift up you know, sort of differences by race and ethnicity, for example, that's information that you could find both in that interactive dashboard and in the cross tabs. And then there is that whole section of the website that highlights the methodology, the analysis, the way that we gather this data, the way that we analyze it, the way that we look at it. But again, we've made a number of these um, resources available to you today. If you go to that website right now, you can download the slides, you can play around in the interactive dashboard immediately. Um, for everybody who registered for this webinar, you'll be getting an email from us in another day or two that has the recording, the slides, and links to other resources um, that help, can help you to navigate and share what you learned, what you're, what's interesting to you about this year's Pulse poll results. Um, we want to thank you very much for spending um, part of your day with us today to hear this walkthrough of a lot of information that we heard from Coloradans um, in the 2021 edition of the Pulse poll. As a reminder, when I end this webinar in just a moment, you'll be taken to a link where you have an opportunity to give us some feedback about um, both how we shared this information, how we packaged it, if there are other ways that we can put this information at your fingertips of you, your colleagues, folks in your community um, to make it accessible and usable for you. We welcome that feedback at any time. And we're also um, going to pose some questions to you in that survey about what you're curious about for next year's edition of the Colorado Pulse poll. Um, if there is a question that you saw this year that you absolutely want us to keep and repeat next year, please tell us that um, because you're interested um, in that sort of year-over-year -year trend over time analysis, um, please let us know that. Or if there's something that you thought was missing from this year's poll that you didn't see us ask a question about as well, please list that up in your, in your comments in that survey or reach out to us at the Colorado Health Foundation because we're very interested in that feedback. It helps us to make those tough calls about what we include in the survey each year. Again, thank you very much for joining us for this year's um, webinar presenting the, the Colorado Pulse poll results. Uh, we appreciate your time. We hope that you'll enjoy diving into the data, and thank you very much.